PhD in theoretical physics from Harvard in 1993. Uh, he worked in quantitative neuroscience and theoretical engineering at uh, Bell Laboratories from 1993 to 2003, and an assistant professor in theoretical physics at Caltech in 96, uh, before moving on to Cold Spring Harbor, where he um, has been since 2003. Uh, he's uh, the Crick Clay Professor of Bioinformatics there actually. Biomathematics. Um, he is interested in... Oh, I Sorry, did not like that. Okay, <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, he is interested in developing an integrative understanding of complex biological systems from a theoretical engineering perspective. Uh, he currently combines experimental, theoretical, and informatics approaches to gain an understanding of how brains work. And today he will be discussing um, much of his work on the Brain Architecture Project, uh, which the basic premise of this project is that uh, while there are great advances at the individual neuron level and the microcircuit levels, there is still a very large gap between at the whole brain level um, of analysis in terms of neural circuitry. So this project seems to actually fill that gap experimentally by systematically mapping the entire brain mesocircuit um, in the mouse and simultaneously addressing some of the computational and theoretical questions that arise. And um, again, we are very pleased to, um, to have him uh, discuss this project here. And I just would like to uh, take a couple of quick points in terms of um, the webinar will work. I would um, love and welcome any questions um, that arise. And if you could um, uh, go ahead and type those into the chat window during the talk, I can moderate them. Um, the speaker, it's actually very difficult to, to um, have all of the microphones on until the because there are a lot of times a lot of feedback issues and what have you. So um, I just would like to keep the microphone off. If you mistakenly turn your microphone on, I, I will mute you during the, uh, during the talk. Um, but if you would like to have, if you have a question or would like to um, speak and ask, uh, ask whatever uh, of the speaker, um, Dr said he would be happy to take any questions, but, but if we can just do it in a way um, that doesn't create strange feedback and what have you over the uh, over IP um, uh, that we're running this on. So I am also going to mute my, myself, um, and uh, but I will be answering your questions in the chat. Can everyone hear okay? I can hear okay, this is Sparta. <laughs> okay, that's great. All right, and I think, uh, yes, and we have someone typing, and people are saying a resounding yes. So, okay, I would therefore um, love to uh, now turn this over to Dr. Mitra and uh, hear about neuronal tractography in whole mouse brains. Hi, uh, hello, uh, thank you, and uh, I'd like to thank the organizers of the webinar for inviting me to present here. Um, I think we are all uh, living through a current era of excitement um, about brain research, which has only grown recently with the announcement of a very large project in Europe to simulate the human brain, and, and there is also excitement about um, a, sim uh, a, a large brain project in the United States. Um, the project in Europe, in particular, uh, provides an entry point for my talk because we can't really simulate brains uh, unless we know uh, how they are wired, uh, what the individual neurons neuronal physiology is, and so on and so forth. Um, and um, also, uh, in the context of mapping the activity of neurons, 
this one also needs the circuit context in which to place this activity in which to understand it. Um, I have, in fact, just posted a uh, little blog on Scientific American uh, Mind Matters uh, website that I uh, would uh, point you to um, with the current discussion of the conceptual issues uh, that underlie this. But I think we would uh, perhaps all agree that um, at the very least, we do need to have a more comprehensive understanding of the circuit diagram of the uh, of various brains of various organisms, um, only one that we do have um, at some level is that of C. elegans, uh, the roundworm. However, I would argue that we don't really know the physiology of the individual neurons, and um, therefore that quote-unquote circuit diagram is still incomplete. Um, so these are exciting times, and um, I uh, organized a series of meetings um, starting in uh, 2007 at Cold Spring Harbors. Uh, the discussions of these meetings are reported uh, uh, in this paper, which led to a um, This was published in uh, PLOS Competition Technology, um, and it Um, uh, we have existing methods that will allow us to map connectivity at this scale. These methods have been around in the neuroanatomy literature um, and have been applied already uh, to studying um, the brains of rodents and of other species. Uh, partly this proposes to take uh, these existing methodologies and scale them up to a um, whole brain uh, systematic level level in a specific organism. Uh, so that's a pragmatic uh, reason that we have existing methodology um, that if we wanted to do this using electron microscopy um, at the level of every synapse, that's currently practical uh, for uh, something as large as the mouse brain. Um, it may be practical for smaller brains such as the fruit fly. Um, and uh, uh, there is such an effort currently going on at uh, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute at uh, generally of arms, but we are still awaiting uh, full reconstruction of the fly optic. Um, so uh, it can be seen that that's a very challenging uh, approach uh, if one wants to do it at the whole brain uh, level for the mouse. Um, so these are the pragmatic reasons. However, there is also a theoretical reason for going at this intermediate scale of organization, namely if one examines neuroanatomical atlases that have been present in the literature. One can see that there is a scale of organization in the brain where every neuron is not necessarily its own independent, uncorrelated entity from every other neuron in the brain. In fact, if one moves, let us say, from one particular spot in the basal ganglia to the very next spot, um, uh, 10 microns away, uh, uh, the basal ganglia would not look, uh, let's say the nucleus would not look very different. Uh, if one did move uh, further distances, say hundreds of microns, then one would start seeing significant differences 
kinds of cell types that are involved, their microcircuits or their projection patterns. But the idea is that there is a scale. Um, uh, um, this scale will depend on which species one is talking about and which part of the brain one is. So it's not a fixed, well-defined scale. Um, but there is such a scale um, uh, at which one map uh, um, projection uh, patterns, so circuitations between uh, different parts of the brain defined at this scale. And that was uh, the uh, content of this particular proposal. And this is what uh, I've set out to achieve um, following this proposal. Um, uh, the Allen Institute, um, as well as uh, a group at UCLA uh, led by Hongwei Dong, has also adopted the same uh, grid based approach that I will mention in a minute. Um, so there are now three. Um, projects which are trying to map the mouse brain meso circuit, if you will, um, and hopefully uh, soon uh, we will have a much better understanding of the meso circuit than we had a few years ago. Um, you could think of it as a shotgun approach. Um, so uh, we first define an injection grid. I will show you a picture of that, where roughly equidistant points are chosen in the brain. In separate mice, uh, each grid point receives an injection uh, with a tracer substance. Now, uh, the choice of tracer substance differs between the different projects, and uh, some of those details uh, are uh, important. But in the project that I'm telling you about, um, we are using two quote unquote classical tracers, cholera toxin subunit B which is a uh, retrograde and an anterograde um, uh, tracer. Uh, BDA, or biotinylated dextranamine, which is at the molecular weight you are, we are using, predominantly an anterograde, but also somewhat a retrograde tracer. These uh, tracer-labeled brains are subject to histochemical processing um, and field uh, microscopy. Um, we also use two uh, viral tracers. Um, uh, one is the adeno associated virus or AOV, AAV, which is used as an anterograde tracer, namely to map out projections coming out of a brain region. And use the retrograde um, uh, tracer, a modified uh, rabies virus that does not cross synapses but gets taken up at the synapse and transports itself back to the cell body. So by using these different tracers, um, uh, uh, one in each mouse uh, at a given grid point, we obtain um, a large number of uh, uh, individual data sets. Uh, these data sets are obtained by sectioning, um, uh, optionally histochemically processing, digitizing, uh, and registering these brains together. I should mention that the technologies that we are using are subjected to change and uh, they have already started changing in the sense that different brain imaging methods are available to process these brains. The basic idea of injecting the brain on a grid, I think, is going to remain in technologies for imaging change. Uh, we initially proposed this. Uh, um, there was uh, some skepticism about this approach, but I think that the fact that several groups are, have now adopted this approach indicates that um, there is some consensus in the community that this is a useful approach. So th this is how the grid um, looks like. On the left side here, you can see um, Um, here you can see a cross section uh, to maintain some, some distance from the boundaries, the obvious boundaries uh, that are present between uh, brain regions while still preserving a grid like um, pattern. Now, each grid point, as I said, receives one tracer injection in one mouse. With the adeno associated viruses, we have 
tried uh, two color injections in cortex in an attempt to separate superficial and deep cortical layers, and we have some success in doing that. So here you see an injection here in motor cortex with some segregation between the superficial and uh, deep layers, and you can see the uh, coming out of that region. Um, here you can see uh, a BD injection in superior colliculus. Um, here you can see um, the uh, to the right of that you can see a um, uh, projection uh, uh, in the uh, pulvinar uh, nucleus of uh, then we have the retrograde uh, tracers uh, first you can see at the bottom here retrograde delabeled cells uh, labeled with collar toxin um, uh, here is a uh, zoom of that um, you can see the individual cell bodies which have been retrogradely labeled the injection is at a a distant location from this region that I am now showing you. Um, here is a, a zoom in of a uh, anterograde uh, BDA uh, injection. Uh, again, you can see the processes. Um, in this case, the injection was in subiculum, and the processes you observe are in the medial mammillary nuclei. Um, uh, and um, I think I have already spoken about the mesoscopic scale. Uh, just to reiterate, it is impractical to define a connectivity atlas for these large brains at the individual synaptic level for, for reasons of individual variation and variation with time. This is not to say um, that such um, precise uh, synaptic connectivity should not be determined. Um, it's just that smaller regions of the brain and then combined with the sort of mesoscopic information we have here. Um, then uh, we have this uh, uh, so-called mesoscopic level of analysis where um, you have maybe 500 or 1,000, uh, depending on how we are um, uh, dividing up uh, uh, the brain. Um, uh, note that uh, these areas uh, not only have cytoarchitectonic differences, but also are known to have segregated uh, projection patterns. Now, ultimately, it is to be noted that each of these nodes will be characterized by many cell types. So this is not a simple point-to-point -point connection uh, matrix that we'll be, we will be getting out. Uh, for uh, this information, we'll have to be decorated with the physiological information corresponding to transmitters, um, neurotransmitter uh, receptor um, that uh, determine the dynamics of the individual uh, neurons in the network. Um, and here is an important subtlety to keep in mind, which is that neurons are trees. So at this coarse level of analysis, um, a connectivity matrix does not provide the complete representation of the mesocircuit because uh, one cannot uh, keep track of uh, the branching patterns um, of neurons. A, a site A may project to sites B and C uh, by sending direct projections to each of those sites, or it may send projections that are branched originating from an individual neuron. To do that, one has to trace uh, individual neurons. Um, and then uh, one has to uh, then include some uh, hidden nodes, in a sense, to this uh, matrix of spatially defined nodes. However, um, so, so I want to emphasize that this sort of mesocircuit is a limited concept, but it has its utility as long as one keeps in mind its limitations. Um, so uh, this is a shotgun approach. The classical approach is more perhaps hypothesis driven where individual projections were intensively studied using both retrograde and anterograde uh, tracers. Um, it is difficult to scale up uh, uh, that approach. We are adopting more of a, a uh, exploratory uh, perhaps or a, um, a shotgun style approach. Um, but uh, both approaches have their uh, utilities. Um, now, th there is also a proposal to uh, map out um, the uh, myelinated trajectories um, of the brain um, at a somewhat coarse-grained electron microscopy resolution, which is a meaningful approach, uh, is still in methodological uh, development. Uh, not all the brain fibers are myelinated, so it will also have its own uh, limitations. Note that sort of the full EM approach 
um, and and I do not overemphasize this time scale here because these time scales will change with technology, but uh, it is not available to us uh, at the very moment. Um, uh, the Brainbow approach is uh, also an alternative approach. Uh, one labels every neuron in the brain with a different color. Um, uh, uh, it's extractable for small chunks of uh, uh, tissue, uh, and will, uh, it will be very valuable for mapping out the uh, local circuitry in the brain. Um, however, there are some difficulties in stitching this information across uh, long um, uh, chunks. So we have set up this uh, experimental pipeline. We have been inspired by the Allen Institute in uh, setting this up. Um, and the basic idea is that uh, there are uh, instruments that are uh, used in the setting of clinical histopathology, um, uh, notably these digital slide scanners, um, the automated cover slippers, uh, stainers, and so on, um, which we can put together into a pipeline glued together uh, with the laboratory information management system, um, as well as a computational pipeline to enable uh, the project that we are trying to do. Um, I have a little uh, video here um, that uh, I'm going to talk you through. So, uh, I will. Uh, so here you can see the sectioning uh, of the brains using a tape transfer method, which we have uh, perfected. Um, uh, you can see two brains being put on a single slide. Um, uh, you can see the histochemical processing, which is also done as far as possible robotically. This is um, auto stainer for nissles. Um, then you can. Uh, um, see the um, operation of these auto stainers if you haven't seen that before. Uh, that's a, a whole brain uh, laid out and each of these plastic uh, boxes contain an entire uh, mouse brain that has been sectioned. And here is a critical step where um, uh, these, are, these brains are then imaged um, using a slide scanning microscope. Um, as I have mentioned, uh, these technologies uh, are in flux um, but the essential methodology is the same. And then we have the informatics uh, end of this. Um, I will show you uh, data we have released on the website uh, shortly. Okay, so let's return for a minute to some theoretical motivations. Um, if one uh, looks at a given uh, node in this meso network, if you want, there are projections coming out and projections coming in. Um, the projections going out may be mapped using anterograde projections. The projections coming in may be mapped using retrograde um, uh, label, uh, retrograde tracers. Um, and uh, note that even by injecting one brain site with uh, anterograde and retrograde injections, one can already start uh, discovering uh, architectural information about the circuit topology. For example, a given brain region may receive inputs from many different brain regions but have uh, directed output to one brain region. I'll in fact be able to show you an example of such architecture uh, in a minute. Um, or it might uh, have divergent uh, outputs but convergent inputs um, or it might be a combination of both uh, of those things. And um, so by using the uh, tracer-based uh, uh, and grid-based approach we will be, in fact, able to distinguish uh, different um, uh, regions of the brain and classify them into these different uh, architectural um, I, I want to emphasize this to show that even before we start reconstructing whole brains, there is useful information to be gathered um, by, uh, there's inf useful knowledge uh, to be gathered by looking at a single uh, mouse brain. Um, at this level of uh, whole brain analysis. Here are some parameters that are relevant for our project. The section spacing is 20 microns. So that gives us about 450 sections, um, half of which we subject to nissle staining and imaging so that we have precise cytoarchitectonic uh, localization. Tracer sections are therefore for space at about uh, 40 microns. Plain pixel size is half a micron. Um, so the raw data that this gives rise to is about a terabyte, uh, a little more than a terabyte per brain. And so 
uh, in the project, we currently have about a thousand brains scanned, which is a petabyte uncompressed. We do compress that data using lossless JP2 compression um, to a fraction uh, of the uh, petabyte, but uh, it is still a very significant fraction. Um, uh, therefore, uh, uh, you can see what informatics challenges are that are there on the other end. Um, and uh, uh, importantly, in, in our specific project, we have got currently half a million uh, sections that are preserved on glass slide that can be re-examined because um, half of these uh, brains are labeled with uh, um, uh, durable uh, chemical stains that will uh, last for a while. So if we want to go back and look very carefully um, at a particular projection, um, uh, that is not possible at the level of the uh, high throughput, um, bright field, uh, uh, wide field imaging that we are doing, uh, we could in principle do that. So since we uh, use uh, the specific sectioning method, we do, we have a problem of registering our sections together. Um, and uh, because we utilize the tape transfer method, uh, you will see that this uh, registration is possible. Uh, there is uh, two adjacent sections, one with fluorescent stain, one with missile stain. And um, this checkerboard pattern here shows, shows the two sections co-registered. I would draw your attention to these little um, spirals here uh, that form the plexus inside the ventricle. Notice how the uh, nissle stained uh, um, uh, um, fragment of the choroid plexus lines up with the fluorescent stained fragment from the adjacent uh, section, showing that physical uh, um, is preserved. Uh, I will also use the same section to show that sometimes uh, you also get uh, a tears. Like here, you can see that in the nissle section, uh, this would have been a continuous um, section, but there is a little uh, tear here. However, this little tear, um, we can uh, still interpolate um, because the physical um, relationship is maintained. Um, let me give you examples of project data. This is a motor cortex injection. In this case, we were successful in uh, a superficial and a deep uh, injection um, being uh, spatially uh, separated in two colors, as you can see. And you can see that that segregation is maintained at the injection site here in the somatosensory cortex. Um, and uh, it is important to note that uh, um, uh, if you zoom in, you will see individual fibers, uh, perhaps individual synaptic uh, uh, swellings uh, and, and certainly uh, cell bodies. Now, um, of course, the goal is to reconstruct uh, into uh, a whole brain uh, projection pattern, and that's what was done for this particular injection that I'm showing you. And you can see uh, that the um, colossal projections to the contralateral side, uh, the motor cortex injection to the contralateral motor cortex um, is coming from uh, um, the uh, superficial layers, uh, supergranular layers, and um, uh, you can see the corticospinal tract coming from deeper layers. Now, this uh, separation is, is not perfect, so I would not um, take this literally as supergranular and infragranular, but it goes a little bit towards that direction. Now, you can see the th thalamic uh, projections here. Uh, remember my comment about collaterals, I can't tell you whether this is a collateral branch or uh, uh, two separate branches uh, just by looking at this data. But that's uh, that's the possibility here. And uh, here you can see brainstem projections. Um, you can also see the striatal projections, um, uh, frontal cortex uh, projections. There are other projections which uh, you cannot see because there are uh, only a few fibers um, that are not showing up at this sort of more macroscopic uh, uh, level of analysis, but are present in the data set and, and we can quantify and analyze them. Now, here is um, that brain just animated. Um, uh, you can see the rotating brain volume. Here again are the colossal projections. Here is the spinal cord. You can see the crossing over. Um, this break is uh, um, due to uh, uh, bad registration. Uh, you can see the somatosensory projection. Um, I will play that. Uh, um, sorry, one more time so you can uh, have a chance to look at it um, and um, you can see the frontal and the somatosensory projections as well. Okay, so let's move on to our next 
uh, injection that I want to show you. This is a injection of a uh, um, uh, modified rabies virus. Um, the injection was placed in the epithalamus and it got fairly well localized in the medial habenula. You can see cell bodies which have locally been labeled. Remember that these uh, viruses are entering through the synapse, um, going to the uh, um, cell body, uh, then replicating um, uh, simultaneously producing green fluorescent protein. Uh, this green fluorescent protein um, then uh, passively fills the uh, rest of the um, neuron. Uh, notice here these are retrogradely labeled cell bodies in the hypothalamus um, and uh, that's why we are injecting um, uh, this particular tracer that uh, labels distant neurons which are projecting to the site of interest. Now here is uh, the whole brain reconstructed um, and this is a, a projection I, I will show you the movie in a minute but here is the injection. Uh, these cell bodies which are individually labeled which are, are in the hypothalamus project to the uh, medial habenula. Now if you go to the literature you will find reports of uh, retrogradely labeled uh, neurons in the hypothalamus projecting to medial habenula but what's nice about this brain is in, you get to see all of it at once and this is really only possible uh, by digitizing the entire data set and reconstructing it. Um, it's very to do by looking at individual slides, um, holding that information um, in, in the human brain, so to speak, and then uh, um, sort of reconstructing it. Mentally. Um, here are uh, um, uh, labeled neurons in the cortex. Oh, I'm sorry. Now, uh, interestingly, um, because the cytoplasm and the axons are passively uh, filled by the diffusing uh, green fluorescent protein molecule, one can also see the output um, of the medial habenula, which is uh, in fact known uh, to be largely um, so Partha. I think he's not here.
uh, through the brains from the uh, Rosa lab. Um, I want to show you a couple other uh, things before I uh, talk about uh, uh, project personnel uh, and, and, and support. Um, we are, uh, this is still a beta, uh, but soon we will be releasing some zebra finch data sets. These data sets were gathered uh, in Harvey Carton's lab collaboratively uh, with myself um, uh, several years ago, uh, but we are putting out uh, this data on the web. Uh, for example, um, I uh, hope this works here. Um, here is um, myelin stain. Uh, sagittal section of the zebra finch brain. Um, I will point to um, this particular section where, in fact, uh, you can uh, see the pathway uh, nicely delineated. Um, and here you can zoom in um, to the high resolution data. Um, So um, uh, I'm hoping also to um, collaboratively uh, work on a mesoscale circuit mapping project uh, in the board. Um, another uh, data set that I want to point to, uh, this is a collaboration with uh, Jin Hyung Lee um, at uh, Stanford. Um, uh, I don't want to go into any details of this project, but uh, the only thing uh, I, I want to do is to play this little Reconstruction. This is a thalamic injection um, uh, in a um, so-called uh, central thalamic nuclei. Um, uh, this video is playing a little bit slowly. Um, uh, these particular nuclei project uh, diffusely um, across the cortex. Um, you can't really see the segregation between uh, layers one and two, which is present in this brain. Uh, but the reason I put this up is that this is a rat brain, and I just want point out that uh, we can, in fact, using the one by three slides, do rat brains and marmoset brains and zebra finch brains. So the same experimental pipeline uh, will be uh, useful to um, create uh, uh, mesoscopic projection maps if one so chose in these other uh, species. Um, OK, so. Uh, I do want to leave some time for questions, so let me uh, first of all thank the many people involved in this project. Um, there are a number of people uh, working very hard in the laboratory um, uh, and people who have uh, uh, worked previously um, in the project who I want to thank. And there are a number of uh, collaborators who have been helping directly, indirectly, uh, some by intensive participation, some with uh, periodic advice, uh, and I want to uh, list uh, uh, them here. Um, and uh, in, in fact, I didn't want to fill up this uh, uh, sheet. Uh, that there are uh, even more people who have helped at a, um, at, a, uh, um, at various uh, smaller levels. Uh, um, I want to. Uh, uh, thank also uh, the Keck Foundation for supporting the initial stages of this project and the Banbury meetings that led to um, the proposal, um, the NIH for uh, funding uh, the project that I showed you data uh, from, um, uh, largely funded through a, a transformative award from the director's office um, and also individual uh, awards from um, the NIMH and NIDA um, uh, are important in this effort. Um, the uh, uh, Colson Laboratory has provided internal funding, uh, my professorship, and also uh, funding from the uh, Simons Foundation. Um, so I will uh, stop there, and um, I will uh, take questions. I will pull up my uh, pull up the uh, website here, um, uh, which you are welcome to also go to separately in your browser if you want to. Browse it while you ask questions. Uh, Partha, can you hear me? I think that uh... <laughs> uh... 
Um, actually, I have a, a number of questions there already that I can answer. Um, should I be doing that? Um, I, uh, I think you have a problem I hearing me. Can uh, perhaps answer Mihail uh, that uh, if there was a particular region, reason we injected the medial habenula, the answer is no. Um, again, we chose a grid-based approach, and one of the grid points happened to land in the medial um, habenula. Um, uh, Anita's question about the marmot data, uh, and, and yes, uh, they were registered with carrot. Okay, sorry, I must have had my microphone mute also. No, you, uh, your microphone's okay. I'm oh, sorry, my, uh, well, my headphone were, was muted. I, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you, and I've been hearing you, but I think that the, uh, you couldn't hear me for a while. Okay, sorry about that. Oh, no problem, no problem. Okay, so great. So um, you've got these two questions, and now we've got, uh, okay, so me, how many cases are ready to be annotated? Um, it's a, another question for Mihai. Um, well, uh, there are the, the cases that are um, on the web together with uh, um, probably a few hundred cases that we have in the uh, lab are uh, candidates for annotation. Um, we are intending to build an annotation interface, which we haven't really completed yet. Um, but if anybody would like to participate in that, um, and, and uh, of course, uh, we have a link to uh, uh, Mihail's uh, database, um, which I forgot to mention. Um, perhaps I can quickly show that, um, just so. Uh, let me see. So let's while you're finding that, okay. I think um, that we have another uh, Partha, any idea how we can map the function at the same level? So, you know, we have several different ways to now start the, these data and use them as a way to add other data around them. I mean, this this relation is really fantastic. Um, yeah, I, I think. Uh, uh, but I I just. Uh, uh, I uh, um, <clears throat> just want to draw attention to the fact that I popped up the connection to the uh, uh, Mihail's uh, BAMS uh, database, uh, which is linked from the info tab uh, from the mm -hmm. brain. So if you go to a particular injection, you can go over to the uh, to the database and file for this uh, beautiful uh, database that is actually very useful. Um, uh, one, one thought I have, uh, there are two ways I think we can immediately We start using the fMRI or fMRI uh, that is being done at the rodent. The rodent. Um, mm -hmm. So we can start co-registering that. Um, electrophysiology or other um, measurements that are the MR set or a whole brain anatomical data set were gathered at the same time that could be used as an intermediate reference to uh, register those activity recordings to the anatomical recordings. And um, I think that's an area which needs uh, better uh, development. Mm -hmm. um, I'm accepting a uh, request from Pat Rice to control the shared screen. OK. I, because I had a request. Yeah. Okay, that's that's great. Um, and I think Giorgio had a question. Um, he's raising his hand. I'm not sure if he meant to raise his hand, but it's Giorgio. Yeah. Um, if I can, you hear me now? Yes, I can. Yeah. Terrific. I have a, a question about the mesoscale. <clears throat> 
strategy, if you like. I think it's a, you, you drew beautiful distinctions between the scales, and I think that they are essential. And I'm wondering if you take the scale that this is meant for, which is precisely the mesoscale, the strength of what you're doing is that it's whole brain. So you're ta yeah. tackling the whole brain. The, the question I have is, for practical reasons, most of us work on specific brain regions. And there are only a few visionary thinkers who take a holistic approach of looking at the entire brain. So for those of us who do work on specific regions, how much will we be able to use this resource on that one brain region, let's say GM, or the dentate gyrus, for example, or the subiculum, which you showed before, uh, or how much is that going to be just, uh, um, you know, a, a preliminary glimpse, but then we have to run higher resolution experiments uh, to zoom in on what would account for, say, only 2% or 3% of the entire structure. Um, I think uh, there will be two points of connection. One is that if you are studying a given region, then these uh, larger scale projection atlases will allow you to uh, examine how this region uh, relates to other parts of the brain. The subiculum injection is a good example, I think, of that. Um, and uh, the other level is you're exactly right. One needs uh, also to uh, have more refined um, uh, connectivity maps uh, and activity maps uh, of uh, uh, individualized uh, uh, brain regions that are studied more intensively. Um, and this sort of multi-scale nature of the problem is something that also needs to be addressed uh, um, uh, both theoretically and, and using the informatics infrastructure. I know that people have raised this point before. Um, but uh, now it's becoming more practical where we will have these mesoscale maps from all three efforts um, and uh, you know hopefully they will themselves be combined um, uh, but more so uh, we will need to be able to connect to the uh, focused studies of the hippocampus like you're doing um, and uh, those bridges will have to be built computationally i think um, it would help though uh, if, if there is sort of an item, it would be when doing this specific brain region study, if one could keep the whole brain uh, and image it at some level, you know, maybe it is MR image before you begin, or maybe after you're done, um, you uh, look, look carefully at a specific region, but you keep the rest of the sections and then image those at some level so you can uh, then take your circuit data and, and Contextualize it in form of the whole brain. I think that would be very useful. If I if I can uh, uh, pro produce you one more, uh, poke you once more. Um, I think that the multi scale is um, is terrific, and I think that that multi scale idea has both a purely spatial kind of resolution. Um, and the other one is what we are, you know, what are the structures that we're looking at? So if you imagine a multi-scale going from, uh, say, tracks in the whole plane to smaller regions that you're still looking with tractography, but in a given region, say the subiculum, but the level of resolution that would, in principle, allow you to see whole new neuronal records. And then you could link both the spatial scales and the things that you're looking at, and of course, asking different questions like you pointed out beautifully in your talk. And then you could go further and say, well, in, a, in an even smaller region, uh, you could still look at the light level microscopy, but also at the same time look at, say, EM or super resolution uh, techniques. And then for, of course, at that point, if a smaller region, questions about um, synapses and their compositions and so forth. And I completely, you know, I couldn't agree more that, of course, computational integration will be essential in that, uh, in that leap. Yeah, I, I think you have said it very well. So I, I really have very much to add, except that I agree with you. Um, I will amplify one point which is the 
activity recordings is one there's an anatomical integration that needs to be done between the different scales um, there is also in integration of the topic of a very large conversation also needs to be done um, and uh, anatomy really provides the framework for presenting uh, those activity uh, patterns i think the analogy with the human can be drawn that the genome is really static structure it has structure at different levels um, down at the level of the base pair but you know there's also structure at uh, larger uh, length scales um, that structure really provides a framework for being via gene expression and means and the same will probably be true in neuroscience uh, you are you're absolutely right there are these different of anatomy that should be integrated together and on top of that we have to think about how to um, integrate the uh, activity and the concrete suggestion there is recording electrically if you're recording optically, then you have an image. If you're recording electrically, then you have electrode tracks, and you can perhaps, um, a particular brain section you're recording from. Um, and uh, this sort of integration is already being done with EM, as there were you know, papers by both from uh, Moritz Helmstrater and uh, Clay Reed's groups that, uh, you know, beautiful papers that we have seen uh, previously. So uh, we, we need more of that um, uh, sort of uh, uh, integration as well. That's great. And actually, I have a, um, a kind of a follow on to that. Um, so you're talking about the spatial registration, which I think is, you know, incredibly important. It's absolutely required. Uh, but just like you mentioned in the human genome, there's another kind of registration, which is, well, which brain region is it, which is kind of the only way that a lot of the older literature that, um, you know, maybe Mihai and some of the other uh, folks have, have been used to looking at. Um, is really registered. So the only way that we know, um, you know, what people have done in the past is, well, they said they looked in brain region X, Y, or Z, and sometimes you can know which um, atlas they're actually thinking about uh, in terms of, you know, when they label something brain region X, Y, or Z. Um, so, um, you know, I, I was wondering if, if you could comment a little bit on not just the spatial registration, but also the registration to um, an actual, you know, I, I don't know if you want to call it the closest label or, um, you know, something maybe a little yeah. more intelligent than that. Yeah, no, I think, um, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, I, I should have made that same point myself. Um, it's a very important theoretical point uh, about these projects that rather than assume where you are in the brain, we can let the data tell us um, either by looking at the cytoarchitecture or by looking at the projection patterns, doing it computationally, uh, doing it objectively in a way that we can all agree so that we don't get into endless debates about which part of the brain is called what um, and, and where to draw the boundaries. I think we can all agree what the densities are, what the landmarks are, and then we can use that as the reference for the discussion. So, so you're absolutely right. It's not just a matter of registering to some common atlas, but also of computationally uh, determining where you are in the brain. So uh, the location question, um, people compare uh, the brain mapping projects to let's say Google Maps, but there is a subtlety there. On the earth, there is latitude and longitude and height um, from the surface and you have got a precise coordinate. Now, brains are different, each brain. So if we had, if you we were all studying just one brain and there was only one brain to study, we could uh, up, uh, apply the same approach. But that is not the case. Uh, there is individual variation across brains. Um, and even with the best attempts to morph and match, um, uh, we, we may not be, we may not succeed in, in defining a uniform coordinate system that would describe everything. It'll be better if we knew where we were on the brain based on the local properties of where we are in the brain and uh, anatomical properties uh, computationally determined um, uh, may provide us a way out of the um, uh, sort of nomenclature problem that Marianne perhaps you also have in mind when you uh, talk about this. Yes, and I think uh... 
so Marianne, um, and, and this is a, a, a bit of a, another question, which I think Marianne is either trying to ask or, or has already. Ah, yes, she's saying that this is uh, this approach is is stating it's it's it is NIF's approach, um, and and that is true. So um, I wonder if you can point us really quickly um, before we wrap up here. Um, to how I could, you know, get this data, how I can, I mean, you've already mentioned that there, uh, the tools for annotation for having the community annotate aren't really ready. Uh, we, well, um, one thing I should, uh, I, I, maybe, should uh, I should, I should say that um, this, uh, this uh, is all resource limited. We are, of course, operating with uh, very sparse resources. I should point that out. You know, there's uh, not the same scale of resources as, as perhaps as you a, guys have or uh, as is there elsewhere. But um, we are uh, uh, planning to make those uh, tools available. Uh, I would be very happy, though, to work with uh, people who want to get engaged in that process. Uh, we are already collaborating with Mihail. That's how those links are up there, and we will, you know, uh, make that uh, better. Uh, anybody else who is uh, um, uh, providing other resources and, and, you know, we want our resource to talk to them, I'm very happy to have the discussion. I would. Uh, welcome uh, those uh, connections. In terms of our data set, how you uh, want to look at it, um, uh, right now, uh, if you click on this PDF button here, um, uh, so supposing I were looking at uh, uh, this brain um, and um, I clicked on this uh, PDF button, uh, you would get a, uh, just a, a snapshot um, that allows you to refer to this piece of data. So that's the very first, if you want, baby step towards allowing um, uh, sort of a, a conversation based on uh, uh, this data, which we want to improve. Um, uh, we haven't yet enabled uh, downloading mm -hmm. of the data sets, except through this sort of PDF um, format, but uh, we do intend um, to do that. Uh, we don't want to overload our servers right away with somebody downloading a petabyte of information. Um, so we will have to do that in steps. Uh, mm -hmm. My plan is to uh, produce uh, uh, compressed versions of this data that, that we can distribute. But uh, the idea is that it will probably be best to do that after registration than before registration. So we will soon be um, putting out some registered data sets, and then you will be able to download those um, at at least a coarse grain level or compressed level. The completely high resolution data set um, I think we will have to do on a more case-by-case uh, -case basis. So if you have need for a particular data set, please write to me. I'm, I'm happy to um, uh, share uh, specific uh, data sets. Um, for kind of open uh, downloading, um, we will have to go through uh, some compression and perhaps some, um, uh, perhaps, uh, some limited downloading of uh, high-resolution data sets. Perfect. Perfect. So um, again, I'd like to thank you. We're kind of out of time at this point, but I, I would really like to thank uh, you, uh, Partha, and uh, I would like to thank all of the uh, people who participated. Um, if you have any further questions, uh, we are available, and I think everybody is saying thank you. Um, so it, this, this was a really a wonderful, this is a wonderful data set, and I, I look forward to uh, looking at it much more deeply through NIF. So, thank you. Um, Yep. Hopefully, we will have this uh, registration. Yeah, thank uh, you for inviting me, and uh, I'd be happy to uh, and, work, work uh, with you. Um, uh, very uh, glad to do that. Perfect. And, and again, thank you, Giorgio. Marianne is saying thank you, Giorgio, and, and um, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and next week, we will have Mihai um, giving a presentation of the BAMS to kind of bring this, um, uh, you know, these presentations together in terms of what kind of data is there on connectomics. So um, again, uh, thank you all. And um, I will be, um, um, we will be in touch about next week's presentation as well. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you.